today's really uh, a bit of a story, and it's a story that um, I think a lot of media companies are facing right now, which is the traditional media business is under a lot of pressure. <clears throat> and a lot of you marketers and advertisers in the room are helping with that pressure because you're choosing to spend your money differently. You're choosing to go to digital peer plays, to try new tactics, to think about content marketing, to do things that maybe the big old behemoth of a publishing business didn't really know how to do. And so a few years ago, we set upon a strategy to try and change that story. And that really meant taking a look at our assets, taking a look at our business, and trying to figure out how are we going to innovate and how are we going to address the needs of what the overall advertising market is looking for. But we're also a pretty big company. And so from the communication side of the business, we were doing the same things that many of you were doing. <clears throat> so if you were in Duncan's presentation yesterday talking about Canadian tire strategy, we have the same challenges. How do you differentiate the retail experience? How do you shift money from print and flyers and traditional means of communicating into a digital world? Well, there's one thing that we believe was the linchpin to help with all of those transitions, and it was ultimately pretty simple. It's data. It's understanding as much as you can about your customer, your audience, your prospect, whoever they may be in your ecosystem and relationship, and then do something with it. Pretty simple concept, and that's ultimately what we were trying to do. But the beauty was, as we went through this transition, we actually hit three things at once. One was we actually solved a big problem for the media business. Two, we figured out a new way to help Rogers Communications, as an integrated telecommunications company, use the same capabilities to market its services and, and, uh, and products. And three, we actually created a new business that is relevant for all of you in the room, and that's the little sales pitch at the end. But when we put it all together, one strategy ultimately drove uh, three, different, three different things. So I think we've all faced the same challenges uh, as marketers and advertisers. You know, how do we better use data? How do we understand our audiences? How do we know we're putting the right thing in front of the right person at the right time in the right format on the right platform and so on and so forth? And the reality is, is that half the time, we guess. We take chances, we test, we pilot. But is that, is that ultimately the best way in which we can do things? Um, even Rogers, you know, um, who are, I mean, the numbers are sort of public, but we're in the top 10 uh, Canadian advertisers from a total spend across channels perspective. I mean, we're not as efficient as we could have been. Our media business works with the communications business to try and help, but at the same time, the CMO, who's now uh, our chief brand officer, you know, he has the same questions, which is, who am I targeting? What are they looking for? Are they an existing customer on an upsell strategy? Are they a prospect shopping around with the different communications companies? And, and what do we do to solve that problem? So we decided to do something about it. So as we built our strategy out to become smarter marketers, ultimately, as I said, it was a better understanding, better access to, and better use of the data within our building across all of our brand assets to make smarter decisions of how we, how we engage with our customers. Pretty simple. The challenge in a big, complex organization, and it's probably something that many of you face, is who owns the data and the information within your building? So it could be the IT organization. We own the CRM systems. We have, you know, that, that's us. It could be the CMO. If your org is lucky enough, like ours now, to have a role called the chief customer officer, you know, maybe it's the chief customer officer's job. But it's not a really simple question. Um, and the rules are changing. And the fact is, is that the data that lives within each of our organizations ultimately, uh, ultimately needs to be looked at a little differently than it had in the past. It's not a remnant of your business process and practices. It's actually a, an incredibly valuable asset in and of itself and needs to be treated like that. So in our organization, we made that determination and actually got together and created essentially a quorum of people. There is no one owner, but it is considered now, data is now considered by our core uh, strategy group within our chief strategy officer as one of the three most valuable assets that the company has. Obviously, we spend a lot of money on network and other things like that, but data itself is now one of the key pillars of everything we do in the organization. So much so that when we even design customer experience journeys, there's a slot at the bottom of each step in the experience of what do we either learn about a customer or what do we know about a customer that we're going to use in defining that journey. So it's become a component of the process by which we actually design the experiences for our customers, whether it's downloading an app and subscribing to Chatelaine online or upgrading your phone to the newest Samsung 
It's the same process and the same data set, and I think that's really, really critical. So we basically had to fight this tug of war and we overcame it. And it was again about proving the value of the information. So we aligned and we made the decision together that that was what we were gonna do. We were gonna create something stronger as an overall company than individual silos. But the problem then becomes, what do you do with it? So you've all probably seen Lumascape slides. I didn't even wanna put the Lumascape slide on here because it's frickin' chaos. <laughs> so this is like the dumbed down version and we just randomly pick logos. So if you're on here, I apologize. There's nothing bad about you. But the point is, is that once you've made the decision that using information, using data to better your business is there, you need to make a decision. And one option or path is we're gonna do everything. We're gonna become a technology company, we're gonna build software, we're gonna build marketing automation platforms, we're gonna build the data, we're gonna hire the teams, we're gonna do it all. The other end is, you know, we're just gonna outsource everything. And we're gonna work with partners and vendors, we're gonna bring in Accenture and consultants and, and whoever the hell on this list you wanna work with and get agencies involved. Um, we made a fairly uh, uh, strong decision to kind of go down the middle, and we'll talk a bit about that, but what we decided was is that even a big organization like us, this stuff is confusing, and it's okay because the world of big data and marketing automation, it is very confusing. There's a lot of players. In fact, the latest Lumascape marketing automation slide has, I think it's uh, 1,600 or 1,800 uh, logos on it. Last January, one year earlier, there were 845 doubled, and there's a few startups in the room, and some of you are trying to play in this space, and it's incredibly complex, and you just need to remember from a brand and marketer's perspective, we need help, not more clutter. So the question from our perspective was pretty simple. From a data technology and a strategy perspective, what did we want to do and what did we want to own in order to take advantage of the asset mix in our, in our business? And what we landed on our epiphany was in order to take our future into our own hands as a marketing agency or a marketing company, was to not be dependent on all those brands in the, in the Lumiscape, not be dependent on our agencies, not be dependent on service providers and technology prov uh, providers, but to own something. And what we decided to own was the understanding of our data, the ability to manipulate and work with it, the algorithm development, the predictive modeling, we wanted to understand our customer base to the point that we would never trust anyone else with it. And again, we got into this, again, from two perspectives. One, advertisers and marketers trying to advertise on our media properties, and two, Rogers as an advertiser trying to advertise out into the rest of the market. But again, same customer base, same information, one plan trying to figure out two strategies at the same time. And in order to reframe the conversation with your customer, Again, our decision was we were gonna leverage our team and our capabilities to understand all of those data points, which I'll go through, understand truly who our customers and prospects are, what do they do, what do they wanna do, what are they looking for, et cetera, across their, their daily journey with Rogers and all of our brands, and not be reliant on building the capabilities of a technology company. So we did not wanna be a software company, we did not want to build all of the capabilities and platforms. So that meant looking in market to partner with the best. And so, that was our strategy. We saw the vision, we saw the future of where we wanted to go. And where did we start? Well, the first thing we did was we took a look for inspiration. And some of the logos on here right now are pretty much the companies that you would think of when I say, you know, big data and digital marketing automation. I mean, these guys have figured out something which is that the information of their customer base is their most valuable asset. They do different things with it, but the point is whether it's big data, small data, behavioral data, retargeting data, purchase history data, content, you know, whatever it might be, this is our inspiration. And they're all usual suspects. And what do they have in common? Well, they all use that information. It's not that you know, great of an epiphany. They use the information to drive results. Different campaigns, different objectives. Sometimes they're doing it for themselves. Sometimes they're doing it on behalf of their clients in the sake of, let's say, a Google. Amazon's really good at getting us to buy shit. Every day I go online and I see little ads for things that are incredibly relevant to me. They just know. It's not rocket science. It's their core business. They've made that decision to make it their core business. And they use the data they have on Canadian consumers, global consumers, but from our perspective, Canadian consumers, to drive marketing performance again for themselves and for their customers. But what's the difference between those guys and a company like Rogers when we looked inside the office? Well, 
the logos I showed before, from our opinion, they know a little bit about a lot of people. So Google's really good at knowing your search history. Facebook's really good at knowing what you tell it you like and what you read and consume from other people putting their content in their environment. But here's a little, uh, a little test. So this is my Facebook profile test. Who in the room in the last three months has actually gone into their Facebook profile and taken a look at all the things that they've liked? One person. Who has ever done it? 10% of the room. So it's a test, and you should go home and do it tonight, and I think you'll be surprised. So I did it, I did it maybe a month ago, and uh, I liked a women's feminine hygiene product. <laughs> And I think it was because I could have won a trip to Jamaica or something. But the point is, knowing a little bit and knowing a lot is all irrelevant if it's not validated and really, really credible information. So just something to think about when we think about data providers and partners to help us with targeting and retargeting and all of these you know, digital slang terms that we're starting to really become part of our typical um, marketing programs. Um, mass scale is great. But if the information is shit, the results are going to be shit. It's pretty, pretty, pretty straightforward. So you just need to understand what you're getting into. Um, I'll talk about why we think our stuff is pretty good. But I think the other piece is, from Roger's perspective, you know, we kind of know a lot about a lot of people. And so it's not just that surface level information, but it's intimate information. Because we have devices in people's hands. We have content and media assets in front of people all day from the time they wake up to the time they go to bed. And you can start to think about all of the different experiences that the average Canadian consumer goes through, whereby a Rogers asset or brand is somehow a component of that, that day's, that day's uh, experience. And so if that's our differentiator, then we need to think about how do we bring it to life. And so whether it's communications, entertainment, content, commerce, we sell stuff too. Um, it's a huge mix of assets and brands. This is just a, a little sampling. And the other beautiful thing is it's multi-platform. So our media assets are not just a magazine. Chatelaine exists now on four platforms. Sportsnet's on five platforms. Um, obviously, Fido and Rogers. I mean, we own the shopping channel, which if you look in our prospectus, does about $500 million in revenue a year, most of it online. So there's a lot of stuff that goes on within the Rogers building that all aggregates to this incredible pool of knowledge about millions of Canadian consumers. And I think when you look across your own asset mix, you'll be incredibly surprised about the things that you'll find because what we've also figured out is it's not just about media assets supporting media advertising clients and agencies, but think about what you can learn from, uh, let's say, self-help forums. So if your brand has an online self-help forum where your community can come and talk to each other and solve each other's problems, what does that tell you about people? What products and services they have, where they live, what kind of things that they do with their devices, their platforms, their products. There is so much knowledge. Are they self-help junkies? Is it someone who wants to do things on their own versus need a white glove service? There's so many different types of behaviors and traits that you can infer and directly ask your customers for. And these things live all over your business. Not just in those, but call center scripts, you know, retail experiences, having your retail reps literally track with a preset list of fields as to why that person came into the store and what they were doing when they were there. Were they window shopping, buying the products? And if they have a profile, how do you append it? Obviously with Rogers, because the device is in the mix, it's a, it's a, it's a bit of an easier play. But imagine the, 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 the journey of the future where a consumer walks into the store, maybe Canadian Tire, because they're quite advanced in that, and the pocket device, the phone in the pocket, triggers the beacon so that the greeter who has a tablet when you walk in not only knows who you are from your profile perspective, but has the last five to 10 interactions you've had with that brand. Not just what you bought, not just what you bitched about, maybe what you were tweeting about the brand, maybe the last NPS score or survey rating that you gave the retail rep last time you were in the store. And how would you change the way in which you engage with that customer if you knew that? in real time at the moment of interaction on any channel. And that's the kind of thinking that as we started to aggregate our data sets, we were thinking about to augment our marketing messages. And so the key is it's not just about advertising, but it's about the way in which you actually use the same information sets 
to deal with your customers in the day-to-day -day, uh, transactions and interactions that you have. But to do that, the one thing we were missing were the right people to put it all together. And the word is pretty simple, it's the data scientist. And it's not just a trend, it's a necessity in today's business. People who actually understand how to extract the value of the information sets that you have. So, <clears throat> I'll give you an example. Um, uh, we are now collecting uh, somewhere in the realm of about 200 million different signals of information a day from everything from our ad servers and every ad that gets sent out to um, uh, the type of device that someone has in their account. All anonymous, all aggregated into segments. And I would never in my right mind think that if Canadian Tire came to us and said, we want to run a campaign on your media assets, we want to build a segment of sports enthusiasts, that we would ever do anything other than build a sports enthusiast segment, right? The, the logical thing is, we'll take all our sports net content, TV consumption data, you put it all together, you understand who truly is a sports fan. In fact, I would say, it's not what the digital pure play guys do, which is, hey, we know who reads and consumes online sports content, but I would argue, someone who never goes on Sportsnet or TSN or any other online sports property, but spends 25 bucks a month subscribing to the NFL TV channel pack, that's a sports fan. People who are putting money into their decisions and behaviors. And so we needed a team to extract that, and so we did, and we hired the team, uh, which was an absolute critical first step. And that was to help us get to the point where we could define and build these segments. So the combination of the data from across the organization, all of our brands, all the platforms, along with the team of people who actually knew what the hell to do with it, and that is where the Lumiscape came in because we hired some good people from some ad tech companies. Um, extract the value, define the segments, start to build the predictive models, build the look-alike models as well so that when you find audiences that you really want to target and they're not big enough, you can figure out how to extend that and find more of them, all with the goal of helping us become a smarter marketer and a smarter service provider to other marketers trying to work with our media business. And so audience intelligence from Roger's perspective was born. And the question from our side was, well, how, how is it better, why is it better, why is it different than a whole other bunch of companies in market kind of say, hey, we can help you acquire more customers, we can do it more efficiently, we're better than that. Well, I think the key for us was we were gonna use it ourselves, and we were gonna use our own acquisition strategies, our own retention strategies, and our own experience strategies to refine the way in which we use the data and the models to then offer that to the broader, the broader industry. So again, think about all the different touch points in the course of a day that any consumer in Canada might go through, and think about how many of those touch points have some relevance to a brand that we have. So, could be watching the news, could be picking and reading a recipe to cook for dinner tonight or tomorrow night, could be just simply using your phone and knowing where you go to work, to the park, to drop the kids at school. A lot of things can be inferred from those kinds of behaviors. Could be ordering something on the shopping channel, traveling to the US, crossing the border for a quick business trip or a shopping trip to, well, I'm from Toronto, so Buffalo, Montana, I guess, if you're here, Seattle. But all of those things put together help to infer and define, I mean, you get it. The segmentation capabilities that we've got from the broad-based sets of data are, are incredible. And so as I said, our goal was to focus on the data, the modeling, the manipulation of it to extract value. And so our key principle, as the title of this presentation was, is if we have information about somebody, use it. Why wouldn't we enable a better experience for a consumer, a prospect, a customer of ours? It just makes logical sense. If I already have, and I'm browsing on an iPhone 6, why would I come to the homepage of your telecommunications website with an offer for an iPhone 6? It's illogical. But if I knew that you had an iPhone 6, and you were a heavy business traveler, because your phone lights up in the US all the time, and you read a lot of travel information and tips on where to go, what would I do differently when you come to McLean's? And how would you, as a marketer, want to use that information in your own purposes, regardless of what product you have? So again, we're starting to see the, re the, the benefits of that. And we let other people manage the tech and the infrastructure, and we really wanted to become the experts in our own data and segmentation strategies. And so the key was, we built it, and now we make it available to the rest of the market. And the data and the information that we take to market is A, yes, it's used by our media business to sell as a service to advertising agencies and direct marketers. 
But that's not where it stopped. So I'll give you an example of a conversation that I had recently with a CMO of one of the largest insurance companies in Canada. And she said to me, you know, we know so much information about four million Canadians. We know what they're worth when they're dead, what they're worth when they're alive. We know, you know, uh, their job history. We know their social insurance number. I mean, there's so much stuff we know about them. We know how much their kids are gonna get if they take off to Jamaica. I have no idea what they'd like to do on the weekend. So I don't know how to market to them effectively. But the combination of what anyone in this room knows about their customers, augmented by what I call the rest of the story, is an incredibly valuable proposition. And so we're running some programs right now with them that are one, from a marketing and an acquisition perspective, how do we bring more people into the family to start to use and buy and choose their services? But just as importantly, is within their own existing customer base, how do they choose what creative, what message, what offer, at what time, in what platform to use to target and to continue the conversation with those customers based on the other things they know? So if you're gonna run a promotion, if you already know the kinds of things people are interested in, whether it's sports, lifestyle, content, entertainment, et cetera, wouldn't you target that offer and promotion differently to different segments? It's, it's, my, it's, my, it's my nightmare marketing story of every morning, I wake up like all of you do, and I'm told every day by my bank that if I wasn't already a customer, I'd get 15,000 free, free points and a flight to New York. Well, if you know I'm a customer, why don't you just tell me something different? Again, digital channels enable that a lot easier than mass, but there are different ways to tackle both. And so how does it work from our perspective? Well, these logos are back because they're really, really important. And I used the word before, which was called mass reach. So we know, as a marketing services company, as a media company, we are fully dependent on the fact that, you know, yeah, Canadian consumers read our stuff. They watch our videos, they watch our TV, they read our magazines, they read our digital channel content but there's a hell of a lot more of them out there, and they're in these places across multiple platforms. And so our goal was to take all that information of our audiences and expose it and find those people no matter what they're doing and where they are. And so we've done that. Again, we didn't build the tech. We rely on others like Google and Adobe and some of the intermediary platforms to help us extend our audiences on behalf of both Rogers and the rest of the advertising market. And we do it across the best, whether it's the big digital pure plays, the Rogers or other integrated media company digital assets, and again on multiple platforms, but not just that. We are working on programs like we've done with ourselves for things like call center retargeting. So how can when somebody calls and has an interaction with your assisted channel, retail call center live chat, how do you tag that person, tag that exchange of information, and then do something with it through digital channels and find them again? So what used to be a digital to digital retargeting is now becoming blurred in, in a multi-channel world and we're enabling those kinds of capabilities. And that's where we're seeing some really good uh, 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 benefits from those types of campaigns. I'm just gonna end with a, a couple of the things that we've kind of called them inside our business, but the first is what many of you might have heard from Facebook, something called custom audiences. But, you know, auto brands are great at spending a half a million dollars to go to the auto show for a week and they get a list of 30 to 40,000 people who might be interested in a new car, what do you do with that data? Well, the old world, you'd send a big, expensive direct mail campaign and have a little bit of a hit rate, maybe not track it that well. Well, imagine if you could take that list, inject it into a system like ours, totally anonymous, find those people, understand, like the insurance company, what else they're interested in, and then tailor the message to them to get them in to do the test drive. Very different value proposition. So, essentially a CRM kind of match program. The second is, as I said before, we don't have enough people, so you want to turn that 30 or 40,000 into 300 or 400,000 potential customers. We have over 5,000 individual traits of data that we're now tracking against each individual profile. And so sometimes things like device, operating system, time of day, frequency of interactions, things that you would never ask for as a marketer are actually the best indicators of performance. And so we let the machines and the data scientists help to drive the lookalikes to give you broader opportunities. And then finally, if we can't actually measure the fact that this stuff works, we're done. So how do we then do cross-channel attribution? So the best way I can or explain this is, we're working now with one of the big sponsors of the NHL, 
tied to our broadcast and, and uh, uh, our rights that we've got from a distribution perspective, to truly understand the value of a sponsorship of a sports league across multiple channels, which is not an easy thing to do because you've got TV commercials, you've got in-branch and in-store activations, you've got new products being launched. Uh, how do you actually show the value of that? And because of the multi-platform assets of the company, those are the types of challenges that we're now trying to tackle on behalf of our advertising and media clients. And the beauty is, is that as Rogers stays in that top 10 ranking of advertising spend, all the benefits that we get from ourselves are now being applied to the rest of the market. So it's a bit of a win-win. Not gonna say Bell's gonna get the benefit of the data, but everyone else is fair game. So that's really what we've done. And the last thing I'm gonna end on is, all of those capabilities, I would say we just simply do at scale. Because of the exposure through all the digital channels and all of the offline channels, we reach a hell of a lot of people. We find them where they are, what they're doing. We don't care, but we optimize against that. We have a ton of data, and there's really no limits on our ability to then find the average Canadian consumer and figure out the best way in which to win, uh, interact with them on behalf of our brand or yours. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.